tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, we asked the San Diego County Water Authority why it wants to raise water rates by nearly 10 percent. And San Diego's auditor says there are serious questions about the city's pension reform measure. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Joanne Farian. And I'm Dwayne Brown. San Diego County's unemployment rate dropped last month to its lowest level in three years. It was 8.7 percent in April, down nearly a full percentage point from the month before. The graph here shows trends dating back to May 2010. The Employment Development Department says San Diego's unemployment rate hasn't been this low since February 2009. San Diego's city, city, San Diego's city auditor says it's not clear whether pension reform will save the city any money. Eduardo Luna says there's just too much uncertainty to know what effect Proposition B will have. The measure would switch most new hires to a 401k style system and would freeze the base pay of current employees for five years. Luna says there may be a cost to that, including a need to increase non-pensionable compensation and employee turnover. He refused to sign off on the city's financial analysis of the measure. We will have more about Proposition B coming up in a little while on Evening Edition. An independent super PAC is jumping into the San Diego mayor's race with a new TV campaign. The group I See Purple debuted this commercial on behalf of Nathan Fletcher, who left, of course, the Republican Party to become an independent recently. Fletcher is one of several independent candidates the group is supporting throughout California. California's nonpartisan legislative analyst has taken a look at Governor Jerry Brown's revised budget plan, and he says it's reasonable with a couple of issues. He says closing redevelopment agencies probably won't save as much as the governor thinks. And analyst Mac Taylor says Brown's proposed tax initiative will likely raise less money than expected. The San Diego County Medical Examiner is trying to determine why a student collapsed and died at San Marcos High School yesterday. 18-year-old Anthony Vio was playing a pickup basketball game when he collapsed. He was pronounced dead at a hospital a short time later. Our athletic trainer, um, our health aide and campus supervisor were performing CPR. They had the, they had the AED hooked up. Um, they did their job. Vio was on the school's varsity football team and planned to go to Arizona Western College next year. An autopsy was completed today, but now the medical examiner is waiting for the results of toxicology tests. Today, a Camp Pendleton Marine was awarded the nation's second highest medal for combat valor. Sergeant Christopher Farias was honored for what he did during an hour-long fight in Afghanistan's Helmand Province. The Pentagon says his actions allowed wounded Marines to be evacuated and kept their patrol base from being overrun. Tomorrow morning, the Navy will commission the new USS San Diego. It's the third ship to be named for San Diego and will be stationed here. It's an amphibious transport ship able to carry about 800 Marines. It is customary at this time for all bachelor candidates to move their tassels from the right side to the left, symbolizing the moment of graduation. Thank you. The sounds of graduation ceremonies at VA Haas Arena today. San Diego State University began three days of commencement activities. The number one degree for the class of 2012 is psychology, followed by criminal justice, liberal studies and management, and finance rounds out the top five. Commencement ceremonies are also being held at CSU San Marcos. San Diego County Water Authority wants to raise water rates by nearly 10 percent. Joanne is looking into why at the Evening Edition Roundtable. The Water Authority blames the higher cost of water from its main supplier as one of the reasons for the proposed increase. Here to explain the other reasons is Sandy Curl. She is Deputy General Manager of the San Diego County, County Water Authority. Thanks for being here, Sandy. Thank you, Joanne. So let's start with the nearly 10 percent increase. What will that mean for the average family of four at home in terms of their bill every month? Well, in terms of the average family, uh, looking at the wholesale cost of water, which you have to understand wholesale water goes to retail agencies, and so the cost of the wholesale water increases about $3 per year um, per family household. So this increase? Uh, it's $3 per month. 
per month. Okay, Excuse so me. it's about thirty-six dollars a year, yeah. and that's assuming that an average family is using how much water? Um, average family is using about one hundred and sixty-two thousand gallons. So we mentioned the cost of water from the supplier. Let's break down the reasons for this increase, starting with that Metropolitan Water District. Great. There's really three drivers for the rate increase. The first and single highest um, cause of the increase is the rate increase from Metropolitan Water District. On April 10th, they adopted a 5% increase, which for San Diego County residents translates into um, 8.5 percent increase because of the way they charge their rates and I can explain a little bit more about that later. The second driver for the rate increase has to do with our investment in supply reliability. Over the last 20 years we have invested about 3.5 million dollars to make sure that we have water here in San Diego County to support the 186 billion dollar economy and 3.1 million, million people that live here and that investment and reliability comes at a cost and so we're experiencing an increase in debt service to pay for those facilities that we've implemented. Um, the latest of the projects we have going on is the dam raise at San Vicente um, Reservoir and those are um, it's under construction and that's part of the cost to increase. And the third component has to do with an increase of water from the um, Imperial Irrigation District through our QSA and that is an additional 10,000 acre feet of highly reliable water and the cost for that water is going up um, as per the agreement under the QSA. I want to talk about the Water Authority looking for these new sources uh, of water, of supply and, and the cost uh, to people for that. But first, let's just talk a little bit about the Metropolitan Water Authority. We know, we've done several stories here on the show mm -hmm. about litigation. So the San Diego County Water Authority alleges that Metropolitan Water District charges San Diego more, more for the water than other districts and, and we're paying for it. But when we look at the increase, it, it, Metropolitan Water says it's only going up 5% and yet this proposal, for other reasons, is going up by 10%. What is San Diego County doing to keep costs down? Because you allege that Metropolitan yes. Water Authority isn't keeping their costs down. So what are you doing to keep costs down? That's correct. We've been very aggressive about reducing the size of the organization, reducing our expenditures. We've laid off employees. We've cut back the organization to be responsible for the environment in which we're dealing in. And the Metropolitan Water District has not done that. In addition, their rate increase um, in a time when there's scarce water, you see a reduction in the cost of supply for Metropolitan, but an increase in the transportation cost. And the transportation costs are only paid by San Diego County water users. And that's because we transport water through the Metropolitan pipes from the Imperial Irrigation District. Is that why you said it for San Diego it's 8% not 5%? 8.5% versus 5 that's correct. So you also mentioned you're looking for other sources of water. This comes at a cost, at servicing costs. Is this when we're talking about desalination and, and other? It's really when we're talking about emergency storage, a supply reliability, increasing the size of the dam at San Vicente will allow us to store more water to have it available during times of need. In 2009, when Metropolitan cut back water to the San Diego region by 13 percent, we only had to take an 8 percent cut because we had local supply here to serve the region. Now, when we do these stories, I often get email from people at home saying, look, I've cut down my water use in the past 10 years, but my water bill continues to increase. And we, we went to your website and saw that since 2007, water use for the county has gone down rather dramatically. It's leveling off in the last mm -hmm. couple of years, but went down quite a bit. Why it, does that come at a cost? When we conserve water, do we end up paying higher rates because of the whole supply demand rule? The cost of water itself is much more expensive today than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. In addition to that, in order to make sure we have water coming to San Diego County, we had to make investments in our infrastructure to have that water here. And so the costs are going up. The reduced usage does mean that there's less units to spread those costs over. And there is a cost to having reliability. But when you're at the end of the pipe, it's very important that you have sources of supplies so that your region can survive during a uh, drought situation.
So this is going before the public. Do they get a chance to, to say something and to speak up about this? Yes. Um, the uh, rate hearing will be set um, at the um, by the Administrative and Finance Committee at our board meeting on Thursday, May 24th, and then uh, and there'll be a full airing of the rate proposal, and then there will be a public rate hearing on June 28th, and at that date and time, the uh, board will consider um, whether or not to go forward with the rate recommendation. So uh, I want to thank you so much for being here, and for people who didn't write down all of that information, we'll be sure to have that information on our website and also right. a link to your website so people can go to kpbs.org. Thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you. Coming up in just a moment, we'll talk about San Diego's pension reform measure with a financial analyst. And we'll have a look at the debate over an East County wind project. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS at 8, PBS's longest-running public affairs series, featuring Washington's top journalists analyzing the week's news. Washington Week with host Gwen Ifill. Then at 8.30, conventional newscasts get thrown out as broadcast media and the web unite for a compelling half hour of today's issues on Need to Know. And at 9, a Mexican-American studies program comes under fire for teaching ethnic chauvinism on independent lens. That's tonight on KPBS. Coming up, Neil Ferguson asks how Western civilization managed to rule the world throughout the whole of modern history. 500 years ago, Western Europe embarked on five centuries of uninterrupted expansion. But could we be witnessing the end of Western domination? Today, the world seems inexorably to be tilting to the east. Civilization. New series premieres Tuesday at 8 on KPBS. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Erwin Jacobs and by be too busy dealing with your own retirement fund to worry about anyone else's, but if you live and vote in the city of San Diego, you'll have to decide on a ballot measure in a few weeks whether the city should offer a 401k system to new employees or keep its traditional pension. KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr tells us what the switch would mean. I'm standing here in the KPBS break room with financial planner Gabriel Wisdom. He's here to help me explain the basics of how Prop B would change the city of San Diego's retirement system. Prop B would freeze the base pay of current city employees for five years, but it would also switch most new city employees, excluding police officers, from a defined benefit to a defined contribution system. And this is what Gabriel and I are going to focus on today. And we're going to do that using eggs. Okay, these uh, bowls of eggs represent three different pots of money. This is the general fund over here, which the city uses to fix things like uh, streets and provide city services. And the bowl in the middle uh, represents the city's pension fund, which it invests in the stock market in the hope that it'll go up and then uses that money to give uh, retirees the benefits that they've been promised. And then this bowl here is the uh, employee's retirement fund. So we have the general fund, the pension fund, and the individual accounts of the retired workers. Right. Okay, so what does the current system look like right now? It's called the defined benefit system, right? Right. That means that the uh, retirees are guaranteed a certain benefit, which is determined mainly by the number of years an employee uh, worked and the salary that they got. So let's say an employee uh, is promised four eggs a year okay. for the rest of their life. Okay. So we take four eggs and we put them in the employee bowl. Okay. The city has to give them four eggs every year. Okay, but what if something happens, like in the last few years when the stock market crashed? So now there aren't enough eggs to cover the required contribution. See, there are only three and they need four. Well, that's where the general fund comes in. Uh, when there aren't enough eggs in the pension fund, the city has to take eggs from the general fund to cover the losses. Okay. 
So we take two eggs from the general fund and we put them in the pension fund. Okay, but that means there are fewer eggs left to cover city services, right? Right. Okay, so this year the city's pension contribution in dollars, not eggs, is about $230 million, which is actually lower than expected because the stock market soared. Yes, but switching to a defined contribution system would mean the city is not subject to the ups and downs of the stock market. Okay, that's what Prop B is proposing, right? Right, it would uh, change the system so the city only guarantees a certain contribution to their retirement fund, like a 401k. It doesn't guarantee what will happen to that contribution. Okay, so let's break this down in terms of eggs. This becomes the employee's retirement fund, 401k. <laughs> yes, but it gets a bit more complicated. Let's say the city commits to putting two eggs a year into the employee's retirement fund while they're working. Okay, so two eggs into the 401k fund. Yeah, and the employee puts one egg a year into their 401k. Okay. And now the employee gets to decide how to invest those eggs, those 401k eggs in the stock market. Okay, so the city's contribution is limited and the employee has more control over how their money is invested. But what happens if the stock market crashes and they lose a bunch of eggs? Well, that's on the employee. So the city wouldn't make them whole then? No. Under this new system, the city only commits to making a certain contribution. It doesn't have anything to do with what happens to that contribution. The employee would have to deal with whatever gains or losses they take on the stock market, which means they might have to do with fewer eggs. Okay, so this is what a lot of people in the private sector went through during the recession. Right. But there's a difference, right? Most people in the private sector are enrolled in Social Security and city employees currently aren't. That's right. Ah, another bowl. <laughs> Got another bowl. This is the Social Security bowl. Uh -huh. So in the private sector, uh, when the market tumbles and eggs begin to fall, Social Security acts as a kind of safety net. During their working lives, most people in the private sector and their employers have been paying eggs into Social Security. Okay, so a couple eggs into Social Security. Once they're done working, they get some eggs back, right? That's right. So if the market crashes and they lose some 401k eggs, they can at least count on their Social Security eggs still coming in. So let's say one egg going back into the employees fund there. Yeah. Okay, but uh, the city and city employees currently don't pay into Social Security, so they wouldn't get those eggs when they retire, right? Right. Okay, although I should say supporters of Prop B say future employees could vote on whether they want to rejoin the Social Security system, but those details have yet to be worked out. Correct. So there you have it, planning your retirement nest egg. Obviously, retirement systems and investments are a lot more complicated than this, but our little demonstration was meant to give you an idea of the basic changes that would be made to the retirement system if San Diego switches from a pension to a 401k. Gabriel, thank you so much for helping explain it. Thank you, Katie. KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr, you can find more about Proposition B on our website along with our voter guide. Just go to kpbs.org slash elections. Monday is the last day to register to vote in the June primary. Voter registration forms are available at public libraries, post offices, and at city halls, as well as the registrar of voters' office. You can also get a form online at voteinfo.net. A measure to regulate health insurance premiums could end up on the November ballot. A consumer group turned in 800,000 signatures today to qualify the initiative. They say it's the same kind of regulation already in place for auto and homeowners insurance. Doctors groups and insurance companies say the measure would not reduce health care costs, but would instead create a windfall for trial lawyers. A group opposed to high-speed rail has started a petition drive to stop plans for a bullet train in California. The proposed measure would derail the plan by shutting off state funding. California taxpayers approved $9.9 .9 billion in bond funding, but the total cost of the project is now estimated at $68 billion. Opponents say it's too much. If the group gathers enough signatures, it could be on the ballot in 2014.
San Diego County's Planning Commission is considering whether to allow, it, allow a disputed wind power project in the East County to move forward. A Portland company wants to put wind turbines in the McCain Valley near Boulevard. KPBS business and environment reporter Eric Anderson says both supporters and detractors gave the panel an earful. I was born and raised in the East County and I spend uh, much of my free time hiking and biking and enjoying the beauty of our East County mountains and deserts. They really are like no place on earth. Maxwell was among a group of people hoping to influence the planning commission. Many in the room were for the project and many like Maxwell were against. Donna Tisdale sees this as just one assault among many on the rural character of her home. She says it's a beautiful region that sits up above much of the county. You can see the Lagunas, you can see the Incapaz, the Hakama Mountains, the Sierra Juarez. It's a 360 degree view. And it's as far as you can see. And virtually every ridge line in our community now, every road will have be lined with turbines and new power lines. And we will have a new substation at every one of these projects. And this is where we live. I mean, this is in residential areas. But neighbors are few and far between in the Boulevard area. The rolling hills are coated with dry chaparral that is punctuated by huge boulders. The valley itself is kind of a rolling terrain and then there is a ridge line that runs along the western edge of the valley that's uh, several thousand feet above the valley and then off to the eastern edge of the valley is where you drop off into Imperial County into the Carrizo Gorge. And there is a reason why they picked the McCain Valley. It's windy here. It's one of the best wind resources in San Diego County. The area already has a working wind farm. The Kumeyaay tribe built 25 wind turbines nearby that generate enough power to light up 30,000 homes. Iberdrola Renewables wants to put 66 to 128 wind turbines here some on that ridge along the western edge of the valley, the rest running east across the valley floor. McDonald says the project will cost between 250 and $400 million to build. We've got wind. We simply have to go where the wind is. And then to responsibly site a wind farm, you got to make sure that there's low environmental impacts, that there's landowners that want to participate, that you've got some place to put the power and it's nearby and we we've got all of that here. McDonald says the project will generate three and a half million dollars in tax revenue every year but most importantly it'll generate enough electricity to light up 60,000 homes. A key part of the project is connecting it to the power grid. The transmission line which is going to connect the entire project located here and tie in to the sdg &E Boulevard substation here. The power line is one sticking point between the county and Iberdrola Renewables. San Diego County officials are hoping to run the transmission line underground. The company says that would add significant cost to the project. Even so, the energy company hopes to win approval. We've got a very good reputation in this industry. We are known for doing the right thing and for being a responsible developer. And after seven years of working on this project, we think this is the right spot. That was KPBS business reporter Eric Anderson. The commissioners decided to continue their decision until June 8th. The company hopes to have the project up and running by the end of the year. Some young San Diego scientists are big winners today. The story in just a moment. Plus your responses to our story about a young athlete facing problems because of her immigration status. This is KPBS Evening Edition. I'm Margaret Warner. On the next news hour, USAID Administrator Rajiv Shah on a new strategy for lifting Africans out of poverty through agriculture. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. An American tradition in honor of our nation's heroes, a tribute to those who have served and sacrificed. It's the National Memorial Day concert with General Colin Powell, Trace Atkins, Daughtry, Natalie Cole, Ellen Burstyn, Dennis Franz, the National Symphony Orchestra, my co-host Gary Sinise, and me, Joe Montaigne. Join us for a night to remember 
the National Memorial Day Concert. Sunday, May 27th, 8 p.m., only on PBS. The American people have named PBS the most trusted source of news and public affairs for the eighth year in a row. Trust. The American people have spoken. Thank you. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. This week, we profiled a 19-year-old track star from Chula Vista who is also an undocumented immigrant. She was almost deported but was saved by a new Obama administration policy. Now she remains in legal limbo. In response to her story, James Morketer wrote on Facebook, she should let herself get deported, train really hard in her native country, and win gold for that country, shouting, how's it feel, over and over. The user David65 commented on our website, just goes to show you when it comes to immigration, we have good reasons to deal with the gray areas. Things aren't as black and white as some may think. And the user P King Duck SD responded, it makes more sense to allow those people to become legitimate so they can actually get work and contribute to our country legally. We well, can still see this report at kpbs.org slash evening edition and you can join this conversation by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, or you can send me an email directly, jferian at kpbs.org. Recapping some of tonight's top stories, San Diego's unemployment rate dropped last month. The rate was 8.7 percent in April. California's overall unemployment rate was 10.9 percent. San Diego's improving job picture may be encouraging news tonight for the thousands of students graduating from local universities this weekend. Commencement ceremonies began today at San Diego State and Cal State San Marcos. And tomorrow, the Navy will dedicate the new USS San Diego. It's an amphibious transport ship. It can carry up to 800 Marines. Finally tonight, congratulations to four young San Diego scientists. Today they won $40,000 for their cutting-edge science projects. They were competing against 1,500 teenagers from 70 countries at the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair in Pittsburgh. Their winning research projects looked at new ways to treat antibiotic-resistant infections. The teenagers plan to save their prize money for college. Well, you can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great weekend. We leave you with a look at the forecast. Good night.